This week's episode of our show is sponsored by Astro Mythos, the Lair of the Spider Lord, a new 5e adventure that is now on Kickstarter. This adventure is based in the world of Astro Mythos, which is a cosmic dark fantasy book series where black holes vie for control over the cosmos. If you are looking for a high level adventure with a great cosmic feeling, adventures in space, but with that dark fantasy element to it, this might be the perfect campaign for you. It is the brainchild of award winning illustrator and author John Sedaris and promises an amazing experience for high level play between 10th and 15th level. I also think that the artwork in this book is absolutely incredible. It has a lot of cosmic horror vibes to it and very surreal and abstract elements put into the creatures and monsters and worlds that are being depicted in this book. The artwork is stunning. It just drips with that cosmic horror mood. And I think it's really worth checking out if this is your vibe. So check the links below to join in on the Kickstarter while it's still live and to get all the information on this uh, project. And now, on to this week's episode. Greetings! My name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. Welcome to our channel where we cover all sorts of TTRPGs, including advice for players and guides for game masters. We upload new videos on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so please subscribe to this channel, like this video, and ring that bell so that you never miss an episode. Today, Kelly and I are going to be talking about how playing Powered by the Apocalypse TTRPGs has made us better game masters, and the takeaways that we got from playing games in these systems that we've since been able to apply to virtually every other type of RPG that we play, in particular Dungeons and Dragons, but it does have a lot of cross-pollinization across any sort of RPGs, so whether you are a dedicated D&D player, you enjoy playing Pathfinder or Call of Cthulhu, Kelly and I really believe that Picking up the Powered by the Apocalypse games, any of them, is going to teach you a lot about the art of being a great game master. When we say the Powered by the Apocalypse system, this is a gaming system that was created within Apocalypse World. If you've ever played Apocalypse World or any of the similar games that use this system, then you're already familiar with it. It is a 2D6 system that you can see us playing in our Monster of the Week series, another game that uses the Powered by the Apocalypse system, which is available right up over there. For D&D fans out there, one such example, of course, is the titular Dungeon World, which is highly influential and Despite the now poor reputation of one of the authors of this book, it does remain a really fantastic source book, and I played the system for many years in between the releases of 4th and 5th edition. So with all that, let's talk about what we've learned as Game Masters from the Powered by the Apocalypse system and what we can take away from it to improve our GMing at any game table. There's a lot to discuss today, so let's get rolling. If you've never played a, a Powered by the Apocalypse system before, here's a basic overview of what makes them unique as far as their dice mechanics are concerned. It's a 2d6 based system, which means that whenever a player wants to perform a move where the game master asks them to roll the dice, they're going to roll 2d6s, add the result together, and then they're usually going to add a bonus from one of their different game statistics. The exact nature of these game statistics vary from system to system, but usually the bonus is plus one or plus two with bonuses any higher than that being really really significant and also quite rare the most common example that we see in monster of the week or the apocalypse world is that they use the stats for charm cool sharp tough and weird these are where you're going to get your bonuses your plus one plus two at most plus three and depending on the playbook which is the character that you are bringing to the table your playbook is going to give you different plus ones or plus twos in those stats, which you can add to certain dice rolls on certain moves. Now, other systems have explored this mechanic a little bit more. Dungeon World, for instance, uses the classic six ability scores that you're familiar with from RPGs like D&D and Pathfinder and gives each playbook a framework that is very similar to the character classes of most fantasy TTRPGs, in which case the characters have moves that are very similar to the spells and abilities of those systems as well. So overall though, the playbooks or the classes 
tend to be pretty rules light. There tends to be not a lot of room for character optimization or character building, although some systems do offer more than this. The emphasis really is just on those core character stats and the moves that your character can perform. Now, the moves are a big shorthand for everything that players do in a Power by the Apocalypse system. And they're a way of giving a term and identifying which of these stats are used to make a roll when a player takes an action. For, so, for example, if we're playing Dungeon World and a player says, I attack the orc, well, that would be taking the hack and slash move, and we would roll that accordingly. In Monster of the Week, the move is called Kick Some Ass, and you get to attack the monster. Now, interestingly enough, in Monster of the Week, when you attack the monster, the monster always attacks you back. But how do we determine how these dice rolls actually play out? The thing is, is that in most Power by the Apocalypse systems, the Game Master rarely rolls the dice themselves. When the Game Master tells the player that they're being attacked by the monster in Monster of the Week, instead of the Game Master making a roll, the player will describe what they're going to do in response to being attacked by the monster, and the Game Master might say, okay, so you're rolling to defy danger, or you're trying to escape, or whatever that player might have described or improvised. This means that the scope for player creativity is really, really high. And while it is easy to get into a pitfall with these games with the player saying, I roll to defy danger, and I roll to hack and slash, if you keep that narrative focus, it ends up being way more descriptive. And with that, every roll that the players make is broken into three possibilities, sometimes four, and we'll get into that in a second. But generally speaking, on the 2d6 roll, if you roll a six or under, you fail. And the game master gets to determine something bad that happens to you. If the result is seven to nine, which for the record is the most common rolls on 2d6, then you succeed, but at a cost. And that's probably one of the most exciting areas of the game, which we'll talk about a little bit later. If you roll a 10 or higher, then you do what you set out to do. In some of the systems, like Monster of the Week, you can unlock features that say if you roll a 12 or higher, because of your bonuses, this means double sixes, or if you manage to land the plus two or plus three, you can get there. A 12 or higher means that you get to add an additional feature onto your success. Some of the systems use this mechanic, some don't, but generally it's broken into success, mild success, or failure. This degrees of success is something that is so powerful and so amazing about the Power by the Apocalypse systems. And honestly, if I were saying my wish list for what would be changed about D&D, integrating degrees of success would probably be the top of that list. Because what this allows you to do as a game master is kind of bargain with your players. When they get that result of seven to nine, you're like, all right, you did it, but. So for example, it can be as simple as taking the Indiana Jones scenario, the player slides under the closing door, but they get a seven. So they slid under the closing door, but they dropped an important item in the process. Their hat. Might be the hat, <laughs> might even be the MacGuffin or something like that. And now you're putting that player in a spot and then the player now gets the opportunity to respond and decide what they do in response to that. So what I kind of love, and even Apocalypse World calls this out in the book itself, is this turns into what's called the move snowball, where the successes, the failures, the partial successes are all building on each other, increasing tension, increasing that suspense. One thing is leading to another. And what I think that this kind of does is it kind of engages that core thing that makes improv so fun is that everything is escalating everything is building on each other and eventually it just explodes into a shower of awesome so success at a cost is probably one of my favorite mechanics here and it is something that you can implement into other ttrpgs we actually have seen this used in D, &D 5e yes. in the terms of some creatures and some abilities say if they fail by five or more or if they succeed by five or more. And there's no reason why us as game masters can't keep that in mind. Well, if the DC is 10 
and they roll a one, well, that's a failure. But if they roll a six or seven, maybe we can offer them something in exchange. And this is, I think, the most empowering thing that the Powered by the Apocalypse systems do, is that ability to make failure and success more interesting than just the binary and being able to inject a complication into success is so cool because I, I think for me it really ties it back into the way we often experience stories in movies, books, and comics where often the hero is getting a it's like two steps forward, one step back. Yeah. And that's really interesting. It gives you so much more creativity and it makes your players respond and engage with the fiction in a much more palpable way. So as you can no doubt tell, this dice mechanic encourages improvisation. And as such, the Power by the Apocalypse systems have an overwhelming ethos that we play these games to find out what happens. And this can be transformative in the ways that game masters prepare and run their games. Because a Power by the Apocalypse system demands not nearly as much planning and prep from you as a game master as other RPGs. There's not as many monster stats that you have to worry about. There's far less mechanical things that you need to be concerned about. And because everything is adjudicated with this very simple dice system, you don't even need to think in advance what the DCs are supposed to be because the system has that baked into it already. And so it offloads a lot of that responsibility and it means that you get to engage with the players and together build that story. Powered by the Apocalypse systems encourage you as a game master to develop a scenario that your players are going to explore with you and give your players the ability to be the main movers, shakers, and drivers of the action. I think that this speaks volumes about good game design. When you're preparing a adventure for the day, a lot of GMs, when they're jumping into their first TTRPGs, make the mistake of trying to predict everything the players are going to do. But in every Powered by the Apocalypse system game that I've ever played, they usually have a small cheat sheet that you fill out that doesn't ask the questions, what are the players going to do? But instead asks the questions, what are the villains up to? And what are their goals? What are their aspirations? And what is the sequence of events that's going to happen if the players never get involved? From there, improv takes the center stage as the players make decisions and you bounce off of those decisions by countering those with what the villains would do to try to rem remain achieving their goals. The Power by the Apocalypse games, in, in particular Apocalypse World and Monster of the Week, really place this sort of interaction between the game master and the players at the front and center and really go into how to manage this very, very effectively. And I think it's one of those things that um, many of the crunchier game systems like D&D and Pathfinder don't always emphasize that the core of the role-playing game is the call and response mechanic between the game master and the players. The game master describes the environment the players describe their actions, and then the game master determines whether or not dice need to be rolled, and if so, what will happen based on the results or outcomes of that dice roll. This core mechanic is universal to every role-playing game. I found for myself that that type of interaction was not clear to me. <laughs> until I had played an Apocalypse World system where that core is what is emphasized. I can very distinctly tell you the difference between me as a dungeon master in D&D prior to when I had ran Monster of the Week and after I had ran Monster yeah. of the Week. And the big difference for me is that before I was writing pages of notes for prep for my games. For one night, I would write five, six pages of notes. Once I had ran Monster of the Week a couple times, my prep work shortened right up because there's that sort of cause and effect where everything that's shown to you in Monster of the Week or Powered by the Apocalypse is that you respond to the player's actions. 
And we know that about D&D, but for some reason it wasn't cemented in my brain till after I played Powered by the Apocalypse that I was just writing down a few notes on the area that they were exploring, what bad guys were around, what their motivations were. From there, it wasn't up to me what the players were going to do. The players were going to interact with it and I was going to respond accordingly. I think that one of the most interesting thing about the Powered by the Apocalypse system is that the Game Master doesn't roll any dice. And so when we actually get into the idea of players are the ones rolling the dice, this actually tells us something very important that we can carry over even into systems where the Game Master will be rolling dice. And that is when the players are the only ones rolling the dice, you are playing the game with the pl focus on the players deciding what happens next. Mm -hmm. And that's the way that all TTRPGs should be played, but it's really put front and center in Powered by the Apocalypse games. Because I, as the Game Master, don't actually get to roll any dice to determine anything, I'm waiting for the players to say what they want to do and then calling for the proper move that they will then roll for to push the narrative forward in interesting ways. At the same time, Powered by the Apocalypse systems really train you as a dungeon master to think about why you are asking the players to roll the dice at all. It makes you realize when you do and when you don't need to use these. You're thinking back because with every die roll, there's three possible outcomes. It's not a binary of success or failure. So you have to put a little bit more thought into every single die roll and think about what the possible outcomes can be. But this is very empowering because it means that you have to commit to those usually before you roll the dice. It's common for me when I'm running um, a Powered by the Apocalypse game to say, hey, this is what's gonna happen if you fail, this is what's gonna happen if you succeed, this is what's gonna happen in between. And so I usually declare that once the player's committed to the action, but before they've rolled the dice. So that tension is existing in the air and it makes every die roll really palpably exciting. I also think that this whole idea means that one thing that we've talked about on this channel before is, is the occasional fudging of dice rolls yes. that can happen from a game master's side. And a lot of people responded to that saying, why are you even asking for a dice roll then? Yes. And Powered by the Apocalypse doesn't give you that option at all. So you have to think about why you're rolling the dice. You, you can't ask for a dice roll unless you're ready to yeah. commit to what is about to happen at the table. That said, Powered by the Apocalypse Systems also teach you that you don't need to fudge the dice because you're in control of the outcomes. You don't have to have the effect of being pulled into the monster's mouth being either the player escapes or the player dies. If the monster is pulling the player character into their mouths and is going to devour them, and that player is now going to make a roll to determine if they escape, well, the failure doesn't need to mean that they were eaten right away. The failure can mean that they've simply now are being held in the monster's mouth. Success with a cost means that they escape, but they get scratched in the leg, so they won't be able to run as fast away. And then, of course, escape is escape, but they're still being pursued by the monster. So in all three circumstances, the player isn't out of danger, but they're also not dead yet. <laughs> And I, I think that this is such a cool mechanic of having the players only roll the dice, and it puts the players as the center focus. But the other thing it does is this moves into our next point, which is the, uh, the fiction focus, which is the idea that the players are going to use natural language mm -hmm. to decide what they're going to do. This is something that we talk about all the time in our D, D videos yeah but the interesting thing here is that because D, D has stacks and stacks of mechanics it is very common for both game masters and players to get in the habit of saying i roll perception or i'm going to use my investigation skill to examine this or i'm going to use my action surge i roll to attack there my turn's done with no explanation of what it looks like. The thing that I love about Powered by the Apocalypse is because of the fiction focus, it encourages natural language. Because the players are the ones rolling the dice and the game master doesn't, 
what I usually tell my players at the outset is there are extenuating circumstances, but generally speaking, I tell them, just tell me what you're going to do and I'm going to tell you what move I'm going to call for. Yeah. And that's going to allow the narrative to take front and center. The player says, I turn on my flashlight and I walk down the creepy hallway. I explain, you notice blood on the floor and they're like, I shine the flashlight down on the blood and kneel over. Well, give me an investigate the scene role. Now I'm the one calling for the role. They're the one describing what they do. And it's that back and forth that really helps drive forward the narrative. And it makes it a much more vivid experience than when you're not using natural language. Yeah, well, you can give the players a move sheet. And most of the character sheets for Apocalypse World systems do give them a move sheet because many of the playbooks have special moves of some kind. The encouragement really is for the, the players to not use terms like roll to defy danger or hack and slash or kick ass and think about what is happening in the world and describe it that way is the task of the game master to then interpret that through the lens of the move system and so i find that when i'm playing powered by the apocalypse games players are less prone to that behavior of i make a stealth check or i make a perception check or i athletics over the obstacle and usually get into that descriptive mode and because the system is fostering that, it often just means that the stories that come out are greatly heightened. And in fact, because most of our players that we play D&D with have played Powered by the Apocalypse systems, it's a habit that falls into D&D very easily. Yeah, and I think that's actually why I highly recommend playing a Powered by the Apocalypse system with your full D&D group. Just a one shot or a two shot because the these ideas that's going to become instilled in everybody's mind allows you to really carry that imagination forward. And really, that's where all of these mm. games exist is in our imaginations. And so having a game system that puts your imagination and staying in that zone front and center allows you to carry that into other games. And... I think that this carries through all of these ideas that we've presented and into the monsters as well. And I think the last point that I want to talk about is one thing that we've already mentioned is that monsters in Powered by the Apocalypse have very few stats and it isn't stats that make the monsters interesting. Yes. And, and indeed, it isn't stats really that make the playbooks or the player characters interesting either in the Powered by the Apocalypse games. They are a much more rules light system and the dice are still important. They are pivotal because of this, this varied outcome. So you're still playing a game. You're not just making up a story and improvising, but the actual stats themselves are things that feed into that narrative and that lead into the interesting fiction in your mind rather than a hard tactical experience. And so this is where I would say if what you love most about D&D &D is tactical combat, you might hate the Powered by the Apocalypse games. But if what you love most about D&D &D is the storytelling narrative and the interesting outcomes that can happen, and also if you're looking for something that isn't necessarily fantasy-based, again, there is Dungeon World, which, yeah. uh, which marries those two together. But Monster of the Week is modern day or it doesn't have to be but when i run it modern day sort of horror stories powered by the apocalypse is your mad max sort of world and you can go so many other directions with this but i find it really interesting that in these games descriptions and unique abilities are what make everything stand out mm -hmm. everything has a unique ability that makes it stand apart if your monster has a cool description and a tentacle attack that grabs you and puts you into its mouth, that's a cool ability. That's enough, and then it has its health and its damage. But you generally don't need like things like complex grapple rules or rules about difficult terrain in, in Apocalypse World systems. I mean, sometimes they exist depending on the system. Like, Apocalypse World has a little bit more support for vehicles because Mad Max, yeah. right? Um, and so... And different Apocalypse World systems will have different ways of doing things like tracking damage or injuries. Often they'll use things like clocks to do that. Um, and so you don't really always need something like hit points and damage rules in Apocalypse World systems. 
again, it, it depends on how sort of classic or retro the, the system wants to feel. And while tactical combat is definitely not the emphasis of Powered by the Apocalypse systems, you can still do dungeon crawls. You can still do all those classic adventures. It's amazing how adaptable to the genres these games can be. And I do find that um, it, it's kind of ironic because Dungeons and Dragons often gets adapted to different genres and it doesn't always succeed at that. Whereas Powered by the Apocalypse kind of works for a lot of things and it really ad easily adapts. Because at the end of the day, yeah. Powered by the Apocalypse is the degrees of success on the 2D6 yeah. system and playbooks with unique abilities and moves. Everything after that is is interchangeable depending on the system you're playing. And at its core, Powered by the Apocalypse is just such a rules light and simple system yeah. that you can slap any coat of paint over top and have it work. And on top of that, the light prep, the light rules, the ease of explaining the rules means that these games are great for one shots, which means that you've got a really good opportunity to get your group bitten by the bug of playing them. If you are having a one shot in the coming weeks, if you're thinking about trying something new, try one of these games. Seriously. It is eye-opening how much it will alter your perspective of role-playing games. And I even think that the books themselves are just wonderful for reading as a game master to even absorb that those ideas into your system. But once you've actually run one of these things, it's it really will change you as a game master. Before playing Powered by the Apocalypse games, I was nervous about my improv skills and I didn't I, I didn't rely on them in my D&D games. I relied on a bunch of written words that I would follow to the letter. Powered by the Apocalypse prepared me to improvise, and it allowed me to explore that side of myself and flex those muscles that I didn't even know I had. Mm. And now I rely on my improv skills in any TTRPG more than most of my other skills. I prepare way less than I used to, and I know that I can rely on the back and forth between me and my players. The other thing I'm going to say, as a final note here, I started having more fun as a game master in D&D. Yeah. When I let go of the stress of trying to know exactly what was going to happen next, and it was because of playing Monster of the Week that I started to relax a bit and realize that I'm a player at the table too, and it's not about me being the master of everything. I still am at the table, game master, I'm the master of the rules. But using those rules to bounce back and forth off of my players allowed the storytelling and the narrative between all of us to become so much more fun and fluid at the table. And if you play a Powered by the Apocalypse game, I'm sure you're going to take some of these ideas and be able to adapt them into any TTRPG you play. So this is just a taste of what we learned from our experiences playing the Powered by the Apocalypse systems. We would love to hear from you if you would like us to give a more thorough and complete breakdown of how the rules work as an introduction to these systems, what Powered by the Apocalypse systems you'd be interested in us talking about more in detail or trying out. And for those of you that have tried them, please share your favorites and your experiences down in the comments below. And also a huge thank you to our patrons for making these videos possible. If you want to help support our work and chat with us about all of these other cool TTRPGs and Powered by the Apocalypse systems, you can follow the links in the description below to find out how. Talking about non-D&D TTRPGs on YouTube definitely doesn't generate nearly as many views as our mainstream D&D videos do. So if you're interested in seeing more content from us featuring other RPGs, becoming a Patreon supporter is one of the best ways to make sure that we have the ability to continue to produce videos that aren't about D&D all the time. And if you want to see us playing Monster of the Week live on this channel, you can check out those videos right up over there. And we have plenty more advice for Game Masters, which I believe is applicable to many different role-playing games right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel, like this video, and ring that bell so that you never miss an episode. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next time in, in the, the Dungeon. dungeon.